Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Do it again. As you've all done before. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me, please? Can you turn with me to Ephesians, the second chapter? And I'm going to be reading from verses, verses 1 through 10. Ephesians, the second chapter. It says, As for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest we were by nature deserving of wrath. But God. I need to say that again. But God, because of his great love for us who is in rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that someone can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Lord, I just want to thank you. I thank you that we weren't just created to just fall away and be nothing. I thank you, Lord, that you created us to have a purpose that you planned out a purpose way in advance for us and you want to do good works through us. Even though what we came from, Lord, it is you and you alone that saved us, that brought us out. And Lord, you have set our feet on a solid rock. So help us to live it, live it, live it, Lord. Holy for you in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Today I'm wanting to just share with you on the topic, but God, the ultimate intervention. You know, last week, I, I said this last week, that as you read through chapter one of Ephesians, you learn some transforming truths. Now, I'm hoping that people, as I said last week, went back and read through part of Ephesians or read the first chapter of Ephesians. How many actually know that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing? If you're a child of God, you are blessed. That you are included in His, God's family of design and His will. That you are valued because He invests His grace in you. And you're at rest because you're included in Christ. You know, we saw last week in the second part of chapter 1, there, there's... That, that we need to have a prayer for wisdom and, and revelation. And it'll help us to get to know Christ better in our walk. That prayer goes on to ask us to see, to see that there is power that is ours. It's in the name of Jesus, and it's ours in Christ. It's a resurrection power, it's a completed power, and it's a ruling power. You know, this, this letter, the Ephesians... What a letter it is. And it tells us how much we are in Christ. In just a few chapters, Paul inspires us by the Holy Spirit. And he sums up the gospel. The whole gospel, the whole passage, the whole thing hinges on these two words. But God. If it wasn't for him, none of this would happen. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be living right now. If it wasn't for him, nothing in this world would be where it is. But God. With those words, darkness turned to light. Hopelessness is thrown aside for favor. A desperate situation is changed to one of amazing destiny. 
Because how many know we were dead? That's the universal plight of humanity, death. Not, not so much the death that we think of when we think of corpses and coffins and cemeteries. I'm talking about the greatest problem is the death spiritually. When the Bible says you're dead, there's no hyperbole. There's no allegorical intention here. It means what it says. You know, we as modern people in love with this present world as we are, we work sometimes hard to convince ourselves that life just is going to go on unending right here. That's what the world wants you to think. The fact is, is that life is just a prelude to an existence that stretches for eternity. And it's either going to be in heaven or it's going to be in hell. You know, as, as Jesus talked with Martha, the sister of his friend Lazarus who died, Jesus said this in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's what he asked. Do you truly believe it? See, there is a pre-existing fatal condition that renders all of us walking dead people. And that's sin. This passage uses two words to define the fatal disease. First it says transgressions. These are things that we do when we wander, we're deluded, we're deceived into places forbidden by God. We don't plan to disobey God many times, but we find that we do. Romans 7 says that even when we have good intention, intentions, we end up in the wrong. Romans 7 says, and I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do it, what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. That's desperate, isn't it? The Bible also speaks, the second word that he speaks of is sins themselves. Now, as hard as it is to admit, sometimes our wills, are fully in function. They're not surrendered to God. We're just doing it all on our own, what we want to do. We make a choice to do what is wrong. We're aware that our actions are morally inexcusable, but we choose what we want to do anyway. See, beyond the individual choices, there's two additional causes for spiritual death. And one is rooted in larger issues. We die because we walk in the ways of this world. We let the values, the fashions of the godless shape our thinking. Yes, it happens to every one of us. No matter how non-conforming we think we are. I mean, think about this. Celebrities wear a new fashion and all of a sudden you see it everywhere, popping up, people taking pictures. They go and buy it and they pick selfies in themselves with what they saw so-and-so have on the red carpet. Maybe a celebrity does a home makeover and you go find yourselves going out and buying the same thing and doing the same stuff to yours. Now, not that there's anything wrong with doing a makeover or doing, having clothes and, and that type of thing. It's the fact that you're looking and following someone else instead of following the Lord. I'm sure some of you, I didn't actually watch any of this, but I heard about it afterwards and saw little excerpt pictures of it about what happened at the Grammys and some of the things that went on and how in a lot of concerts today, you're finding people playing with Satan, doing devil things on stage, dressing up like it, acting like they have demons all around them. And what is that doing to our young people or anybody else that's following along? What is that telling them? It's okay. We're just having fun. 
See, these are the things that I'm talking about, that we start walking in the ways of the world. Think about how many people start following blindly the woke movement in this country. And they don't even, they don't even know the actual truth in all of the situations. They just hear something and they're gone. Oh, let's go. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's protest for this. I'm not saying there's some things that we do need to stand up that are wrong. And we do need to protest them. We need to stand up for what is right. But there's so many things in this world that they just want to get you distracted from God. And get you on a mindset for something else. That's walking in that way. We also die because we become controlled by the ruler of the kingdom of the air. See, evil is not just a force. It's personified. A created being of immense power and influence rules invisibly in the air. We know who he is. He's Satan. His aim is to destroy anything and anyone that God loves. And we all know who God loves, right? Everybody. He's crafty. Drawing humanity into his schemes, yet hiding his diabolical intentions. And what happens? We die. We die spiritually. We are incapable of responding to him as a, you know, when we... When this happens, it's, it's impossible to respond as we're supposed to. It's like a corpse responding to the expressions of love that are spilled out from grieving families. They're gone. They're either in heaven or in hell. See, we willfully choose to disobey God. We are captivated by the values of this world. And we're deluded by Satan. Now, how widespread is this disease? Ephesians 2, 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. Following us desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. The gavel of the judge of every man comes down with a bang. The verdict, we're guilty. The sentence is death. Now I know this kind of preaching is not always popular. It's, it's rejected by many, especially in this tolerant society. Some people would say it's frightening. What are you trying to do? Scare us? Well, if it'll scare you right, I hope so. It devalues human beings, some people say. It ignores the gospel of Jesus, some people say. He just loves everybody, so nobody's going to go to hell. It's frightening. But guess what? The truth is, many times, it's frightening. Especially when you're on the wrong side of the truth. See, this desperation of our natural state, the the fact that we're guilty and deserving to be consigned to death, and we're, we're, we are judged to be destructed by our by our creator. But aren't you so glad? This, this is what makes the gospel so much more amazing. That that fatal condition that we all came from or may be in as a remedy. You know, they try to find cures for all of these other things out there in this world, every disease. There's one disease they cannot find a cure for, and that's sin. But God, but God, but God has a remedy. But God, because of his great love for us who is rich in mercy, made us, what, alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, by, it is by His grace that we are saved. But God, the ultimate divine intervention, 
It's all celebrated right here in his word. You know, when I was younger, we all, we often spoke about someone getting saved. And there was a lot of mockers. There still is. But there was a lot of mockers back then. In fact, when they heard you say that, if you told someone in the world that I got saved, they would be asking, what'd you get saved from? Hmm? In a little mocking way. But isn't it a, a, a correct description when they actually ask, what did you get saved from? Because how many know we were all adrift? As good as dead, cut off from God, cut off from life. It was the end of our story as far as we were concerned. But God stepped into the situation and he rescued us. Why? And this is where it gets really intriguing. See, because if I save something, it's because I, I, I see value in it. If, if I retrieve something that I may have discarded, I, I realize that, wait, wait, I, I may be able to use that again. Sometimes I can do that with wood. I'm working with something, and I'll just toss a piece over, and then went, Whoa, wait a minute, I may be able to use that again. I'm going to put that over in this pile. Or I may see a new use for something. I remember that there's some value in that. Well, see, God saves us. He saves you and he saves me because of his love, his mercy, his grace, and his kindness. He sees the value in us. Hallelujah. In our conceit, we may hope that we can add to this value. Or that, you know, God's saving me because he really needs me. He needs me, okay? That's just not true. Paul's words really hit this point because he keeps repeating them. Love, mercy, grace, and kindness. All of this in the mind of Christ, in the mind of God, is why he intervened. I want to reread the scripture, what I just read earlier. But God, because of his great love for us who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. And even when we were dead, he brought us back out. And it's by his grace that we're saved. He raised us up with Christ. He seated us with him in heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. See, he's, when he does this, he is showing the world how great and gracious and loving he truly is. He expressed his kindness when he gave us Christ. For it is by grace that you're saved, through faith, not of ourselves, so that no one can boast. It's a gift, a gift from God. Because we are his handiwork. We are created by him to do good works. And he's already ready and planned a place for us. See, grace is not a new idea to Christians. The problem is, is that we grow familiar with it. And in that familiarity, some of us lose the wonder of his grace. You know, there's sometimes I think we should start every worship service by just taking time to reflect back over the previous week. Just come in, sit down, and think about this. Think about every impatient act that you did. Think about every selfish moment that you did. Think about every slight to someone for who had no, that you had no consideration for. Think about every angry word that you uttered when someone irritated you. Every failure to respond to the Spirit's call. And then after we have confessed all of those sins, then maybe we could sing Amazing Grace and really, really mean it. You do know how amazing it is, right? How amazing his grace is. 
You know, this passage also speaks of the incomparable riches of God's grace. You understand that there is nothing on this earth that can illustrate the gift that he has given us. Nothing can compare. Nothing can come close. We did not deserve it. We did not invite it. Yet what did he do? He gave it. A commitment of himself to us. What does God's grace do for us? It makes those of us good that we're dead. Alive that we're dead. We're alive in Christ. You know, we were already immortal creatures when God created us. You know, this body may die, but eventually everything comes back together and we continue to live. Spiritually, we're alive and that will never go. It's either destined for heaven or destined for hell. And if we're in Christ, we know where we're going. Oh, hallelujah. We know that one day we'll be sitting right there with him, face to face, loving, worshiping him. This body, yes, it's going to die at some point. But that will not mean the end of my existence at all. Why? Because I'm alive in Christ. Oh, hallelujah. It, all it's going to mean is a change of address. I'm just going to go from here to where my true home is. Not in this foreign world, in this foreign country. I'm going to be released from the limits of time and space into the unimaginable. You know, there's a phrase that we must not quickly pass over in this text. God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You know, last week I, I was talking about this, about being seated, being the signal, signaling of completion, that, that God said it was finished, the job was done. You know, in our day-to-day -day experience, you know, we're working out the implication of what it means to be a Christian. That's what the Word is for. It helps us daily work out our salvation with Christ, trying to find out what He says for us to do and living it. There's days we're better at it, <laughs> and days we're not so good at it. But our natural inclination, because of the... The way things work in our human relations, we many times assume that God the Father loves us a little more on those good days and then just doesn't love us quite as much on those bad days. But the Word asks us to focus away from our performance for His work. See, we're not supposed to be going, Lord, I'm going to try to do all this good for you so that you'll love me more. What did Brother Bowerham just read? His love is never ending, always going. We just sang it. It isn't more for you on this day and less for you on this day. It's always the same. He loves you. It's by His grace, received by faith, that does the finished work in us. I'm just saying, it's almost this. I'm almost if I'm in heaven already. Now, I know some people abuse God's gift. They push it to the extreme screen because they'll, they'll go uh, that they sin and grin. Not really living a holy life. I can just do what I want. God's already saved me. I'm fine. Not walking in the spirit as they're supposed to be walking. Their lives become a mockery of God's grace. So you might ask, are they still Christians? Are they saved? Well, what does the Bible say? No sin will enter heaven, right? Paul tells the church not to sin so that grace abounds more. He says, no, don't sin at all. We're to live a holy life. But if we do, if we make a mistake, we have to ask forgiveness for those sins. Otherwise, we return to the life that we were in before we were saved. 
Paul tells us, but here's what I know. It's a sad, miserable Christian who gains his assurance of God's love and favor by just tracking his own performance. It's a paraphrase of it. It's like saying, Lord, I know you're going to save me once I can get all this other done. No. See, the spotlight should be on what God's gift is to you and how it changes your life. Salvation begins with God's gift, grace. The ultimate intervention, grace. And then how does it become ours? By faith. How many know faith is not the same as belief? There's a lot of things I can believe in that I don't act upon. Therefore, I cannot claim that they're faith. Many believe that exercise would improve the quality of their life and help them to live longer, but do they do it? <laughs> they don't exercise at all. There's millions of people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for their sins, that He was raised to life at the resurrection, but they don't have faith in it. The demons know that He did. <laughs> they know who He is, but they don't have faith in Him. See, if people really did have faith, their lives would be getting to align with the will of God. But as we see, they don't. Why? Because they only believe. They don't act on their faith. See, James contrasts saving faith with belief in this passage. He says, dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starred, and you say, good morning, friend, be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you just walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I'm giving you, a, a, I think, the message translation of that, but you see that. Now, I can already see and hear people agreeing this. Sounds good. You take care of the faith, and I'll just handle the works. I'm sorry, but that's not the way it works. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith works, works, faith works all has to go together like a hand in a glove. Are you professing to believe in the one and the only God? Are you just complacently sitting back as if nothing special or wonderful has been done? You know, demons do this. They can see what's happening. They can know what's going on. But does that get them to anywhere? Do you really think that you can say, I believe in God, I have faith in God, and not do anything? This world wants to do it. They say it all the time. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. But they've never experienced the ultimate intervention. They've never experienced the true grace of God. Think about Abraham. He says he was made right with God by works when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar. Isn't it obvious that faith and the works went together right there? Because he may have said, I believe in God, but he had to continue on and do what he was supposed to do, and that sacrifice to show that he truly believed in God. See, that's the works that we're supposed to be having. Because of God's grace and his mercy that he saved us, we're supposed to be living it out. Abraham believed God and was set right with God. That means he believed 
and he did it. You believe and walk it. How many of us know that we understand that if we ask the Lord to forgive us and we die right then, that of course you may not have had a chance to do works. You've accepted Christ, you're going to heaven right then. But that's not what usually happens. You're saved and then God says, I need you now to start living it and going out there and showing it to this world. Showing him the ultimate intervention in your life. trying to get us to understand that God has given us the most beautiful gift, yet we got to do something with it. He intervened in our life when we were dead, and now we're alive, and we got to do something with it. We can't save ourselves. It's all a gift from God. It's God's plan. You know, the, the world is full of religionists who start They start with a focus on God and they end up congratulating themselves as being one of the good guys because they did some stuff themselves. See, that's a subtle trap of Satan. Getting the mind off of God and putting it on yourself. God's Spirit comes into our sin-dead lives. We're raised to a new life in Christ. You do understand that, and I'm sure there's maybe some, I'm not looking at anybody, I don't know your previous life, but you may have been, a, as they say, a hellion. I mean, a real pain. <laughs> and you caused a lot of pain. And people knew who you were. But then you accepted Christ. And people saw the difference. They saw that, wait a minute, what has happened to you? People take note, believe me. They admire the change that comes into someone's life. When they see you change from what you used to be to what you are now, they're like, what happened to you? I remember my dad used to tell me as a Marine, you know, he was saved young, lived in the Christian home, went off to the Marines, left the Lord, But when he came back to the Lord, he was still in the Marines. And his friends used to call him out and say, hey, let's go here. Let's go do this. Let's go. We need to meet here. And he's like, sorry, guys. I don't do that anymore. I've given my heart to the Lord. And they're like, come on. Really? And then they saw that there was a huge change in his life. And I remember him telling me about others that would go, wow. Wow. You can change. I wonder about myself. Let's not take that temptation to show off, but let us live with that grace. Give God the praise for what He's done and the good thing that He's done in us. We need to make sure we hit our knees in confession. If we, al- if we try at any point to take credit for what God did in our life, we need to fall to our knees and say, Lord, forgive me. It was you, but God, you alone that changed me. You made me alive. You made me new. See, God does the, both the creating and the saving. Created us and He saved us. Nothing else can we do of ourselves. It's God's workmanship displaying His craftsmanship in our lives to this world. You know, there was a person that lived in Massachusetts. His name was Daniel Chester French. Some of you may know who he is. He was a sculptor who did the Lincoln, actual Lincoln sitting in the Lincoln Memorial. He crafted that out one chip at a time from a block of marble. I thought about that. And then I thought, what is God making of you one day at a time? Or maybe are you allowing God 
to intervene and make something of you one day at a time? Are you open for the but God interventions in your life? Please don't believe what this world will tell you. That who you are, what your, what your situation is, what to have faith in. If you're a follower of Christ, don't become complacent in God's grace. Remember, it's a gift of life that he has given you. We cannot work our way into heaven. We cannot do that. It is but God intervening into our lives that made us a child of God. So let's make sure that we're living the humble life. The humble life we need to be as a child of God. Not forgetting that it is the ultimate intervention of God that keeps us from the punishment of the death that we deserve. Live your life holy. You make a mistake, ask for forgiveness. He said he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will make you whole again because of his wonderful intervening grace. I want you all stand with me, please. Do you remember that first initial but God moment intervening in your life? When your life, as, as Brother Bowerum said that song, he took you out of the miry clay and set your feet upon the, the rock to stay. Or maybe you're looking for another one of those but God interventions out of his love and his kindness and his grace and his mercy, not so much to save you, but to, to reach something that's been happening in your life. Because all of those situations where he meets our needs, where he blesses us, where we have his favor, are but God interventions. It isn't us intervening. It isn't anyone else intervening. It's God intervening. I want us all to bow our heads I want us to ask the Lord right now. If there's someone here that you're in that situation and you, you're at that point in life that you don't know anywhere else to go. And you need God to do something miraculous in your life. Whether it's saving you, saving you from your sins, or whether it's a healing, a deliverance from an issue, a problem, strength, peace, joy. All of these things are interventions by God, the Holy Spirit touching your life. And it can only happen when He does it. If that's you, I want you just to ask Him right now, God, you, you alone, with your love, your kindness, your mercy, and your grace intervene in my situation right now, Lord. Mm. Intervene, Lord. Not my will, but your will. Do your will, Lord, in my life. Don't let me try to take credit. Don't let me get in the way. Let me just stay humble and accept the beautiful gift of your grace, of your touch of your deliverance, of your healing. Right now, Lord, help us, Lord, to not get in the way, but be open for those but God moments. I'm asking you, Lord, to touch this church right now. We need a but God moment to intervene in some things that are in this church and happening. We need you, Lord, right now, you to touch situations. We try to plan, we try to do, we try everything, but we need to stand back and see you do the work and then give you glory and honor for all that you're doing, for that intervention in our lives. 
go out, not just say I have faith in God, but go out and show everybody that faith by doing and living for you. Sharing that beautiful gospel, letting people know God changed me and he can change you. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. In your precious name, help us to be open to you. We want to see more. What I'm asking, Lord, not for us to get any notoriety. And even if it doesn't spread anywhere, I just ask for that fire to be right here in this church. Among those that are praying, Lord. That there would be a spontaneous fire that moves out from here and reaches our community. Lord, it doesn't matter whether they're coming here or going to someplace else as long as they're hearing your word. Yes, Lord, we want to share it. We want to be the hospital and the open place to help the hurting and to, to be there, Lord, to meet needs. We want to be used by you. But whatever your will is, Lord, do it. And let people be touched. Let them see your beautiful grace. Let them feel the, and know the God intervention in their life. And we ask all of this. Oh, in your precious name, Lord, help us with the words of our mouth. Let us make the actions in our heart and our lives be acceptable in your sight. Let us live holy for you, Lord. And we ask this in your beautiful and precious name. Amen, amen, and amen. I hope you... I know we talked about a lot of things today and the things that can creep in, but I hope you focus on the but God, the beautiful ultimate intervention that he has done in your life and that he continues to do in your life. And then you go show it to this world, amen? I want you to go out there and show people and share the gospel. I hope to see you all next week. Please invite someone. If you can come out on Wednesdays, please come out on Wednesday. And if you do need to speak with Sister Bernice or myself afterwards, please catch us. But I hope you have a great and blessed week.